Well, good morning. Welcome to Parish Presbyterian Church on this Lord's Day morning. And with the news from last night, with the assassination attempt, um, we're also in the month, the government has called for a month of prayer and fasting. We have a sheet for fasting that Pastor George wrote on the book table. You can grab one of those, very helpful. But in light of everything going on, let's just open with prayer for our nation, um, for those who are grieving, and for um, our, those in leadership in our nation. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that Jesus is on his throne, and that our hope is that Jesus rescues us with life everlasting. Um, but Lord, we cry out for mercy on our land, and God, we pray that you would protect us, Lord, protect your people, protect those in government and President Trump and President Biden. And God, we ask that your mercy would turn our nation to humble ourselves, to cry out to you and to turn from evil. And Lord, we ask for you to show the wonders of your steadfast love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we have from the very start of our service this invitation to the gospel, the great hope of sinners. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come, buy, and eat. Well, as we come to this gospel feast, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Please stand. Preserve us, O God, for in you we take refuge. You are our Lord. We have no good apart from you. The Lord is our chosen portion and our cup. You hold our lot. The lines have fallen for us in pleasant places. Indeed, we have a beautiful inheritance. We have set the Lord always before us because he is at our right hand. We shall not be shaken. You make known to us the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Amen.
Scripture reading today is from 1 John chapter 3. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Hear now the reading of God's word as it is found in Psalm 17. Hear a just cause, O Lord, attend to my cry. Give ear to my prayer from lips free of deceit. From your presence let my vindication come. Let your eyes behold the right. You have tried my heart. You have visited me by night. You have tested me. You will find nothing. I have purpose that my mouth will not transgress. With regard to the works of man, by the word of your lips, I have avoided the ways of the violent. My steps have held fast to your paths. My feet have not slipped. I call upon you, for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me. Hear my words. Wondrously show your steadfast love, O Savior of those who seek refuge from their adversaries, at your right hand. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings from the wicked who do me violence, my deadly enemies who surround me. They close their heart to pity. With their mouths they speak arrogantly. They have now surrounded our steps. They have set their eyes to cast us to the ground. He is like a lion, eager to tear, as a young lion lurking in ambush. Arise, O Lord. Confront him. Subdue him. Deliver my soul from the wicked by your sword. From men, by your right hand, O Lord. From men of the world whose portion is in this life. You fill their womb with treasure. They are satisfied with children. They leave their abundance to their infants. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied with your likeness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. As we've gone through the last few weeks, um, I've been using the guide of the Heidelberg Catechism, which gives the outline of the Christian faith as misery, which is where we begin, deliverance, and then followed by a life of gratitude, just showing our love for the Lord. Um, Psalm 15 showed us our misery, who can dwell in the tent of the Lord? And everyone falls short. And Psalm 16 gives us a window into the Messiah from the inside. We get to see his own thoughts. Um, And God delivers him from death. He never sees corruption. And that's our deliverance in Jesus. And Psalm 17 shows us the boldness of a prayer of a righteous man. And it shows us how we walk in gratitude towards the Lord, obeying his voice. And let's pray that God gives us the same spirit that wrote these words. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for Christ. Lord, that you have seen our misery and you deliver us. And our deliverance has nothing to do with our performance or our religion or our good works. And everything to do with Jesus alone. 
And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us to live a life that is pleasing to him and teach us how to pray, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. How should you pray in the face of persecution? How do you pray when you're surrounded by evil? Have you ever asked that question recently? How do we pray when there's an assassination attempt? Well, there's this great example we are given words from God. Here's how to pray when you are surrounded by violence. And we are taught to pray in Psalm 17. He's given us words. And it's amazing to me. He doesn't just ask for deliverance. He asks, God, would you protect us? God, would you deliver us from the wicked man? But he goes beyond that and said, God, in all of this, I want to see the marvels of your love. That's what I'm after. And God, I pray for deliverance in this life. But then he goes beyond and he says, Lord, I want to be satisfied forever by seeing your face. That's the prayer of a man in persecution. So we're taught here how to pray. And it begins with the question of why should God even listen to your prayer? We have these first six verses, which are an argument. God, hear me when I pray for these reasons. He's arguing. And he shows us how to pray. He says, God, would you hear a righteous cause? And this language is very strong. You know, we expect God to say, listen up. You need to listen to what I have to say, pay attention, give me your ear. And God gives that command multiple times, hear, O Israel. But here the psalmist is taking that same phrase and saying, God, hear me. And this language is so strong, it's not exactly a command that you would give to someone like your child, but this language is so strong that it's written in the imperative, it's, it's a command to the Lord. God, listen to me, hear me, pay attention. And there's this incredible boldness that comes from the believer because the blood of Jesus who died on the cross for sinners and his resurrection opened the door to heaven. And we get to go boldly into the presence of God just like a child coming to a dad who's busy and important and no child goes to his dad and says, Dad, I really need to talk. Would you please make an appointment with your secretary so that I can come talk to you at some point this week? Right? None of my kids have ever asked me that question. They just come up, and it doesn't matter how busy you are, Dad. And then they'll start talking. Faith expects God to listen. Isn't that incredible? There's this expectation. He doesn't presume on God. He knows God is in glory. God is holy. God is his king. But with all of his respect, he comes expecting God to hear him. So faith is, there's this boldness that's in faith. But also persecution makes us fervent in prayer. We are needy. And this prayer, David said, God, would you hear my cry? This is not the nice, polite, silent prayer that you pray in your room. David is speaking loudly to the Lord. He is crying out, and there's emotion in his voice, and you hear this repetition, God, listen to me. God, pay attention to me. God, give me your ear. He said the same thing three times. So we have confidence joined with desperate need in this prayer. And this is how we come to God, not presuming everything will be fine, I, I can do whatever I want, but with this real confidence. And we see in this prayer book of the Psalms, I started looking up, where else does the psalmist pray for God to hear him? Where do you pray that God would hear your prayer at the beginning? And this, it showed up so many times I, I quit taking note. <laughs> All through the Psalms, the psalmist is asking, God, please hear me. God, 
Would you answer my prayer everywhere in the Psalms? And that's because we don't pray like the rest of the world. Any other religion, you just say the magic words and you're done. Or you're a religious person, and so here are the things that religious people do. And here's what religious people say when they pray. But when you pray, you pray to a living God who is not distant. And you pray to a God who cares to hear you. And so our prayers are different. They're bold, and we ask God to actually pay attention. So when you pray, you should believe that you are actually praying to someone, and you expect him to hear. And that's because the righteous are as bold as a lion. There's this confidence, there's need, and then he explains, God, here's why I can be so bold. The righteous are as bold as a lion, even in prayer. And your lives, the way we live, affect the way that we pray. I don't know if you've noticed this. The New Testament gives lots of examples, just one of them. Peter says, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, giving honor to them as the weaker vessel, as fellow heirs of the grace of life, so that your prayers are not hindered. What Peter is saying is the way you live in marriage... The way you behave to your wife affects the way you pray to God. And we hear that and think, well, that that sounds extreme. But anyone who's ever been there, you can testify. When I'm terrible at home, my prayer life is not going well. You, You can just see it. The way that we live affects our prayers. And when you live in an upright way, and you're walking with the Lord by the Spirit of Jesus... You can use that as an argument in your prayer. He says here, God, I'm not here praying in a deceitful way. I'm not lying, pretending to be one thing, and and I'm not. I'm not here trying to score holiness points with my Christian friends. God, I need you. I'm following you, and I live in this unjust world where the peaceful protesters at an abortion clinic are convicted as felons, and one of them goes to prison, a federal prison. God, we live in an unjust world. And so we cry out to the Lord, vindicate me. I am appealing to the Supreme Court. Not the one in D.C. There's one over that one. God, I am appealing to your judgment seat. Would you declare that I am in the right? even as the world wages war against me. So he's crying out to the judgment seat of God, and he says, God, you know me. You have tried me. You visited me by night. You have tested me. Can you imagine this verse 3? Can you imagine praying like this? God, please answer my prayer because you know me. You've tried me. You've seen me at night. You have tested me, and you will find nothing. So Lord, hear my prayer. Are you open to God probing your heart as you bring requests to him? Because God does test us. It says in the Proverbs, the crucible is for silver, the furnace is for gold, and the Lord tests the righteous. Well, God sends tests, and he does it the way that a smith tests gold. And you know how a a goldsmith tests his gold? He throws it in the fire. God looks at your faith and says, this is more precious and valuable than gold. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to throw it in fire. And it will be no worse on the other end. And so when you're going through suffering and you're asking, why me? Well, do you know what we get out of suffering? We get to show the glory and the honor and the praise of Jesus Christ who saves you. It shines like gold in your faith. It brings glory to Jesus. And so the psalmist is able to say, God, you you tried me. You're not going to find anything. I've made a commitment with my mouth not to transgress. All that God has to do to test how well you're doing is look at your words, your mouth. 
and how hard it is to control our tongues. James said you can tame any kind of wild animal. People can do it. But I want you to try to tame this one. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> James said that's a lot harder. And so the psalmist is able to say, God, you can test me, and I've made a commitment not to sin with my mouth. There's this obedience that leads to boldness in prayer as you walk with the Lord. So how do we grow in praying like this? Well, you can't live by doing what is natural to you. The psalmist says, with regard to the works of man, by the word of your lips, I have avoided the ways of the violent. Did you catch that? The works of man, all right? Human works. Well, what does he mean by that? He tells you at the end of the verse, violence. What is natural to fallen man? Murder. Shooting people is not the abnormal thing in a fallen world. That is the native work of the human heart. And so this psalmist said, God, I have avoided the ways of the violent. How did you keep yourself from violence? How is it that you change? If you have a sin that's plagued you for life, how do you change? By the word of your lips. We are brought out of our native sin by listening to the word of Christ. James 1 tells us, Of God's will, he brought us forth, or he gave us a new birth, by the word of truth, so that we might become the first fruits of his creation. God is doing this work of new creation, and he delivers you from sin by the word of Jesus, the message of Christ crucified for sinners. It gives us a new birth. How is it that a young man keeps his way pure? By taking heed according to your word. And Jesus, as our priest, he prayed for us. He said, Father, would you please make your people holy? Make them different from the world? Make them different from what they are by their sinful nature? How? Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. God, sanctify them by your word. And so when we grow in that sanctification by clinging to the word of Jesus, you're able to pray, my steps have held fast to your paths, Lord. My feet have not slipped. What a bold prayer this is. God, I am walking the same road that Jesus walked. He said, follow me. And I'm here to follow him by the Spirit. So when you've been following Jesus, it gives you this great confidence. You can expect God to hear your prayer. Isn't that phrase amazing, God? I call upon you because I know you will answer me. You will. And how often we don't pray when you reverse it. Lord, I don't pray because I don't believe that you will answer me. That's the reverse. But faith comes with this expectation. Lord, you will answer me. It's confident. But it's also not presumptuous. It says, God, you will answer me. Please answer me. <laughs> the next phrase. It, there's this belief and this confidence, but it's not presumptuous. It comes with this needy trust of a child. So when you have God's ear, this is how you should pray. And this is how you pray when you are being persecuted. God Show the wonders of your love. Isn't it amazing? He's about to pray, God, deliver me from the violent man. He's surrounding me. He's trying to kill me. But before he gets there, he says, God, this is ultimately what I'm praying for. Lord, would you show publicly that you love your people? Would you make it clear in my day? And as he prays for safety, he continues that same note. It, it's such a beautiful picture. God, would you please keep me as the apple of your eye? And that phrase in the Hebrew, they don't say the apple of your eye. The way that they said it was, God, would you keep me as the little man in your eye? 
If you've ever gotten really close, I noticed this with babies, with my babies, you get really close to their eyes and you see this tiny little image of you. There's a reflection of you in their eye. And so he's praying, God, would you come so close to me that you see a reflection and there I am in your eye and protect me with the, the way that you would protect the most precious part of your face, your eyeball. Lord, keep me like that. God, keep me like a baby bird and I'm in the nest. I need protection. Cover me like an eagle covering its babies with the shadow of its wings. I want to be in the shadow of the Almighty because there are wicked men who surround us. And you know, in the Bible, it says, put on the whole armor of God because you're on a battlefield. That's not just a nice metaphor. Well, that's a great way of thinking about life. No, you are on a battlefield. And David says we are surrounded by these violent men that are powerful and have strength to oppress. And the psalmist describes what the enemies of Jesus are like. Violent, deadly, pitiless, and arrogant. That's a description of these enemies of Jesus. They are unfeeling, so there's violence that's there, but also it says they close their heart with their fat. And you say, wait, would you please have mercy and show pity and know my heart is covered over, you can't access it, you can't penetrate. And they surround the righteous hoping to take away life and knock you to the ground so that you never stand up again. So pray for the deliverance of God's people. And pray that God does it in such a way that he shows his amazing, steadfast love publicly to his people. And he prays here at the end, God, would you arise? Would you confront him? Would you subdue him with your sword, with your hand? Go to war against our enemies. God, do something. Would you put an end to this violence? So he's praying for deliverance, but he doesn't end his prayers only by looking at this life. He actually goes beyond, and he says, God, would you deliver now? Would you show your steadfast love now? But ultimately, Lord, would you give us each our portion? And here, the image of the violent man shifts. And you get, this is what man outside of Jesus is at his best. And there's a great picture of this in um, the book of the Odyssey. The Greek hero of Odysseus. Um, he was kind of a transferring hero. It starts with, who's the strongest guy? Yeah, that's our man. And then the Odyssey, they're like, well, okay, strength is great. But also, it would be great to be really strong and clever. And so you have Odysseus as one of their heroes, and he is given the chance to live on a, this glorious island with a goddess and just forget about his family. And he says, no, I would rather go home to my wife and my son. And there's this great line from the Odyssey, where shall a man find sweetness to surpass his own home? And so he said, no, I'm sailing home. And he eventually makes it to his wife and son. He brings justice and a sword against his enemies. And this great happy ending could have been written by this psalm. His womb was filled with treasure. He was satisfied with children. He left his abundance, his kingdom, to his infants. That's how the Odyssey ends. Because that's the pinnacle of the man of this world. That's the best he can have. But I want more. And the psalmist, even facing persecution, said, I don't just want deliverance. This is what I want. I want to behold God's face. And I want to be done with sin. Jesus' righteousness has been given to me, given to my account. I'm clothed in it. I want to be perfect with him in glory. I want to see his face and become like him. And so he's looking here beyond death and saying, God, this is ultimately what I pray for. God, I want to be satisfied with your likeness. And what 
a hopeful description of death is here. The Bible describes death in all sorts of ways, but here we have death. Its sting has been removed. Someone has pulled out the fangs from death. And the psalmist looks at death and he says, this is what it is. I will be going to sleep. That's that's what death is. And as soon as I go to sleep, I will awake in your likeness. I will be there looking at Jesus face to face and no longer dragging all my sin with me. I will be looking at Jesus and I will become perfect like Jesus. That's the longing of the believer. God, deliver me. God, protect us. God, show us your love, but ultimately this is what I want. At the end, on the other side of the grave, give me eternal life, rejoicing evermore. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that even surrounded by violence, our hope, Lord, is that one day we will be satisfied looking at your face and reflecting your image. And God, we thank you that that's what's coming to every believer in Jesus because of his righteousness and death. Um, But Father, we also come confessing. Search us, O God, and know our heart. Try us and know our thoughts. We keep on hearing, but we do not understand. We keep on seeing, but we do not perceive. We have made our hearts dull and our ears heavy and our eyes blind. We have not seen with our eyes or heard with our ears or understood with our hearts. We have not turned to you to be healed. Lead us in the way everlasting. And here is this word of hope. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. This is the promise of God. This is the word of the Lord. Therefore, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith, for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Amen. Let's stand and sing. have the message of his glory and also of his grace, which we get to remind one another and profess before a watching world. Christian, what do you believe? We believe in God, the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and now sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, 
the one holy Church, both visible and invisible, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Therefore, we praise you, triune God. And we join our voices with the angels, the archangels, and the whole company of heaven in this hymn of eternal praise. shows his wondrous, steadfast love in the Savior, the Lord Jesus, who came to give his life for us, to deliver us from hell and from sin. But David's prayer is, I want more. I want more of you, God. And so the Lord gives us a meal to celebrate, to taste and see and be satisfied in the likeness of the Savior. It was on the night when our Lord Jesus was betrayed that he gave thanks and he broke bread and said, this is my body, which is for you. Eat in remembrance of me. In the same way he took from the cup, he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Drink all of it in remembrance of me. What a display. This meal is of his love and his glory for his people. If you're here today and you do not know the Lord Jesus, you have heard the gospel from Psalm 17. Now believe it. Repent of your sin and turn to your Savior as your only hope in this life and the next. Refrain from these tables, but run unto Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. But for the people of God who are like David saying, I want more of you, God, in my life. I want to commune with you today. Then don't wait. Run to these tables. Lay hold of his mercy and find grace in your time of need. Let me pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the whole counsel of of your word that we see here just in this bold prayer of Psalm 17. Oh Lord, you show us your glory, your love, and your grace. Oh Father, would you encourage us, strengthen us, protect us, and bring us all the way home? Lord, give us a taste of that as we taste this meal of ordinary means set apart for holy use. Make us holy and pure like you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Dear ones, we have three tables spread before you. Go to the one that is nearest to you in the hustle and the bustle and grab uh, either grape juice on the outer ring or wine on the inner ring. We have a common cup and a common loaf and gluten-free bread on the white plates. And for all of us who need prayer, 
Go to Pastor Jamie in the foyer for prayer. The gifts of God for you as people. Be satisfied in his love for you.
Let's now go before the throne of grace in prayer. Lord, have mercy. Have mercy on us, on our families, and on our nation. Because your steadfast love is from everlasting to everlasting, because your steadfast love is better than life, have mercy on us. You alone, whose name is the Lord, are most high over all the earth. Keep us as the apple of your eye. Hide us in the shadow of your wings. Guard us from the man of violence. Compass us about with songs of deliverance. Pour out upon us grace abounding that we might, in these troubled days in which we live, have strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. We know you move in mysterious ways, your wonder to, wonders to perform. You treasure up your bright designs to work your sovereign will. So, Lord, have mercy. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on our families. Have mercy on our nation. Merciful Lord, hear our prayers. We're so grateful uh, that our legislature and Governor Lee have called us in this season to fast and pray. It uh, could not come soon enough. So we cry out to you, Lord, in this season of repentance and prayer. We cry out to you for the families of Butler, Pennsylvania, those who have suffered grievous loss and have observed horrors. We pray for uh, President Trump and his quick restoration and healing. We pray for President Biden and all of our magistrates as they lead us through this fractious time. Pray that you would sober us, temper our affections so that we love our neighbors without ever uh, withering away our principles. Enable us uh, to melt away our animus uh, while standing firm, speaking the truth in love. Lord, have mercy. We pray, Lord, for uh, ongoing healing and restoration for Cliff and Karen, for Melody, Mike, uh, Frank, and Asher. We cry out to you, Lord, for comfort and consolation for Jim following the loss of his father. And we thank you, Lord, for the safe return of the Dalton mission team. We will even now rejoice. For you, O oh Lord, our King, so we will, our Lord and King, adore. We will rejoice. We will give thanks and sing and triumph evermore. We will lift up our hearts. We will lift up our voices. We will rejoice again and again. We will rejoice forevermore, praying just as Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's now stand and sing Psalm 17.
Jesus Christ, hear now the Lord's benediction. As you go forth from this place, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. joining us for Lord's Day worship today. I want to remind you of uh, the um, governor's call for prayer and fasting. And one way we want to help you with that is with a handout on fasting and prayer. Grab one of these on the foyer on your way out. And we have a new members class coming up this Saturday from 9 a.m. to 12 right here at the church. If you haven't signed up and you want to join us, Please sign up on the bookshelf in the foyer or let the church office and Sarah know and we'll get you signed up for that special time. If you have already joined our church and haven't been through the new members class, come on and be with us on Saturday. Also, we have a new mom shower for Marie Vetters uh, this next Sunday, uh, July the 21st from 3 to 5 at the Anderson's home. And on the way out, we have a new June-July missions newsletter from our church. Grab one of those on your way. Grace and love be upon you.